proudly presents America's Invisible Heroes radio talk show. Tune in weekly on Sundays from 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Pacific time with your host, Consuela Mackey, co-host, U.S. Air Force veteran, Matt Davidson, announcer, Taylor Marcella, U.S. Army veteran and Strategies for Hope segment host, Dr. Kathy Cash, U.S. Army Reserve veteran and entertainment segment host, Charles Whitehead, U.S. Army Special Forces veteran, and I once was whole segment host, Richard Cook, U.S. Army veteran and lifeline for women's veterans segment host, Martha, Elena, Varela, National Faith Director, Chaplain, and Veterans and Recovery segment host, Anthony Akinpora, and U.S. Air Force veteran and incarcerated to success segment host, Kevin Lewandowski. For more information or to be a guest on our show, email info at OperationConfidence.org. Operation Confidence is a grassroots nonprofit. The organization's mission is to provide stable housing for veterans who have experienced homelessness, as well as providing a wide range of supportive services. To help accomplish our goal, a successful landowner has donated land for the project, a world renowned architect has offered to design the houses, and construction classes from the local community colleges will take part in building the houses. Your support and donations are needed. To get involved, please visit our website at www.operationconfidence.org or email info at operationconfidence.com. Okay, well, welcome everyone. And thank you for tuning in to Americans Invisible Heroes. Yes, I'm your host, Consuela Mackey, Executive Director of a grassroots nonprofit organization called Operation Confidence. No, I'm not a veteran, but my heart goes out to our American heroes, especially those with a disability and have experienced homelessness. For those who are new to the show, American Invisible Heroes was created to for veterans to share their experiences, heartfelt stories, resources, and challenges. Now, allow me to have our board member, Taylor Marcella, to introduce our co-hosts for today. Of course, our co-hosts for today are U.S. Air Force veteran Matt Davison, who's the vice president of OC, our Operation Confidence. We have U.S. Army Reserve veteran Charles Whitehead, who is also a board member. We have our bi-monthly segment host, U.S. Army veteran Dr. Wendy Childress, with her bi-monthly segment, Living Life Completely. We have attorney Eric Olson with his monthly segment, Helps Nonprofit Law Firm and Anne Monahue with her bi-monthly segment, The Rosie Movement. In honor of Black History Month, Operation Confidence and its board members of directors would like to acknowledge First Sergeant Jack McDowell, a Montfort Point Marine. Take it away, Charles. All right. The Montfort Point Marines were the first African-Americans to enlist in the U.S. Marine Corps after President Franklin Roosevelt issued an executive order establishing the Fair Employment Practices Commission in June 1941. The recruits trained at Camp Montfort Point in Jacksonville, North Carolina from August 26, 1942 until the camp was decommissioned on September 9, 1949. The largest number of Marines to serve in combat during World War II took part in the seizure of Okinawa with approximately 2,000 seen in action. One such Munford Point Marine is First Sergeant Jack McDowell's many postings in his 26-year career, career as a U.S. Marine was the, with the Marines Embassy Security Group. He worked at embassies in New Delhi, Kathmandu, and other embassies around the world in the 1960s before Vietnam. First Sergeant McDowell was one of the first to serve in integrated companies and was a drill sergeant for white recruits. He was awarded three Purple Hearts along with 16 other medals and citations before losing his leg in Vietnam and being honorably discharged. McDowell was raised in Brooklyn, New York, although much of his family lived in the South. He, listed it, he enlisted in the Marines when he was 17, faking his mother's signature on the permission form. Gentry Smith, originally from North Carolina, joined the diplomatic security branch of the State Department in 1987 as a special agent. 
He worked his way through the ranks in charge as regional security officer at embassies in Tokyo, Rangoon, and Cairo before moving to management. He left DS in 2014, become an, ambas an ambassador at large in the Department of State's uh, official of foreign missions, re yeah. retiring in 2017. When Joe Biden became president, he pulled Smith back in, appointing him to the Assistant Secretary of State for Diplomatic Secretaries in August 2021, the first Black special agent to hold the position. Gentry Smith's father is McDowell's first cousin. On May 5th, the Diplomatic Security Service Public Affairs Group coordinated a meeting at McDowell's home in the International Tower of downtown Long Beach and still lives there today. Isn't that nice? During one of Secretary Smith's West Coast trips, Jack McDowell is just an awesome guy, Smith said. If it hadn't been for Jack, my parents probably would still think I was opening doors for important people at an embassy, Smith laughed. With his background, he was able to explain it to them. McDowell said he was proud to hear a family member had reached the upper levels of the State Department. His stint with the embassy security group made him realize the importance of his diplomacy, uh, he added, of diplomacy, he added. It was really the first time I was able to talk to someone who was in the family and not have to explain what it is I do, Smith said. With his background, he was able to tell me so much. While the two were together in front of the cameras, at least, there was little talk about their groundbreaking roles in the Marines and State Department. But McDowell admitted his long Marine career had, a, had made a difference. Most of the African-Americans did their tour and got out, he said. A few of us stayed in, though, and uh, a few of us stayed in, though, and got the opportunity to see both sides, segregated and integrated. I have to say, it was not all that easy. I saw it smooth out in Vietnam where we were all busy. We didn't have time to worry about who was what color. First Sergeant Jack McDowell received a Congressional Gold Medal for his service as a Montfort Point Marine. First Sergeant McDowell honored Operation Confidence as keynote speaker at, uh, at our tribute to disabled veterans event held in Veterans Day 2016 aboard the Queen Mary. Now I'm gonna show you some pictures. pictures and uh, you know, and show you how you know this 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 guy is uh, you know he was doing it. You know, let's see here now. Kidoke. So. so there we have uh, Connie. And uh, Mr. McDowell right there and uh, the whole group. You know, this is on the Queen Mary in 2016. And uh, as you can see, there was a lot of people. And it, uh, it was, I wasn't there, but uh, Connie, tell us a little about it. Yeah, it was an amazing event that we had. It was a tribute to our disabled veterans held on on. Veterans Day 2016, it was such an honor. And by him being an amputee, you can see him there in, in this military outfit. He uh, is an amazing individual. He shows no disability at all, very prom very prominent in the community and in, within the Air Force. I'm sorry, within the Marines. And uh, he's just done some amazing things and we're so thrilled to have him as one of our heroes. Uh, for Operation Confidence, of course, with the uh, honored as the, with the uh, phenomenal individual that he is. So I thank him with the Montford Point Marines for all they're doing, the, the ones that are still around. And that uh, was quite an honor. Thank you uh, for showing that, Charles. We're moving right along here now. Uh, Matt, take it away with your guests. Okay. Um, every now and then, I receive a heads up about a new book that's out. And, uh, you know, I, I like to read about that, see what's on the book market. And I recently got one heads up that as soon as I saw it, I knew that I had to have it. And this is it. It's called Why You Matter. 
and it's by our next guest, Ellie uh, Painted Crow. Um, now, this book will probably not make the New York Times bestseller list because it's not about political corruption, racial hatred, book burning, or greed. Instead, it's about love and sacrifice and serving and giving and wisdom. Ellie is from the Yaki Nation in Tucson, Arizona. She is a retired Army veteran, a mother of two sons, and a grandmother of seven grandchildren. She currently lives in the Central Valley of California, and her current work is in concern with uh, helping women remember and find their sovereignty and purpose. Uh, as a in terms of service, uh, Ellie was the founding member and advocate for women's services in the veteran administration system to promote awareness and provide support to military service women. She was an Army veteran, and her last tour was in Iraq in 2004 where she served as a service senior commissioned officer responsible for base camp support operation. In terms of service and sacrifice, again, Ellie has been uh, working with alcohol, drug, dual, dual diagnosis, a counselor. She's been an uh, intervention specialist program manager uh, in Merced, Santa Clara counties. She's a social worker, uh, adult protective services, child protective services, health department, Merced, San Benito counties, California. And she's an advocate and uh, she serves as associate director and advocate, providing support for clients receiving services for domestic and sexual violence. She's a very busy lady and, uh, and she's doing wonderful work. Yes, she and is. I think, I think that she needs to have this book on the New York Times bestseller list, <laughs> whether it will or not, I think it should be there. Oh. That's wonderful. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, by the way, did I, did I say that Ellie is from the Yaki Nation, Tucson, Arizona? And, uh, okay, so you like that. That's her background, uh, though she lives in California now. Um, with my somewhat limited knowledge of Native American history. I, I know something about the Lakota Sioux Red Road. And I would like to ask you, Ellie, what your feelings are about the Red Road and how it may pertain and help all of us here on earth at this time. I, I don't know. Thank if you. Heard. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for um, sharing my life history there. <laughs> <laughs> the different work that I've done in, in you know, the last 30 years. Um, I'm grateful, first of all, to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And, you know, um, just want to say um, I'm grateful for all the work that you're all doing. And I'm not too connected so much with the Internet. It's still challenging for me. <laughs> uh, so you're doing a good yeah. job. Yeah. Uh, so, like, I just wanted to share, you know, that um, in terms of the Red Road, uh, the Red Road has a lot of meanings, I think, depending, a, a, a lot of it's based on recovery, um, abstinence from alcohol, drugs, substance abuse. Uh, that's the primary intent is, but I believe that it's more than that myself. I feel like it is. Uh, it's actually a, a way to walk. And um, 
I wrote this book. I want to share about this book because that's part of it that's in there. And I wrote this book because I've done a lot of different working communities in um, with with veterans, with veteran women. I was part of the building, the creation of the Service Women Action Network when it first started, and um, <coughs> just really learned that what I know about people is that. Um, Everybody just wants to know they matter somewhere. Everybody just wants to be acknowledged for, for being, not necessarily a skill, but just for being. Right. And what I really found was a lot of people don't have that in their lives. And so uh, I wrote this book to sort of share, uh, share about the Red Road, share about recovery, share about trauma, share a little bit about my personal life and share about how indigenous people view uh, systems differently than, than what we're currently experiencing um, with the colonization that has taken place and that mostly that's what people know. And so I bring an introduction about the another, another perspective of how to build community, of how to build um, a system that's more inclusive. And the Red Road is really part, a lot of it, because what we find is just a lot of people are hurting. There's a lot of use of, of a lot of different things, not just drug, alcohol. People are addicted to drama. People are addicted to spending money. People are addicted to violence. People are addicted to a lot of things because that's sort of how the, it, what makes them feel alive. And so I think that the Red Road is 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 a it's not just a a thing you talk about. It's actually a walk. There's some values. Ah. In it. There's some teachings around it. Ah. It's, that's very very inclusive of all people. Yeah. And so the red road is is just really learning how to know yourself and to take your walk seriously of your life, so that you can share that whatever you've learned in your life with other people. And I don't know if that's that defines it for you, Matt, in terms of Red Road? It, it is very Great. well. Um, also, you have a, a section in here that says, connect to your spirit. And uh, these are important because it talks about knowing yourself as a spiritual being, developing spiritual practices, begin a spiritual discipline. And all of this that you write in here is a guide. It's like a, a map which can lead people to peace and happiness and fulfillment. And uh, it's, it's, it takes you from step one all the way to the end. <laughs> there really is no end. Um, it just continues on and on till, uh, till, till you uh, see life as a journey, yeah. in which it is. And hopefully it's a journey that takes you where you want to be. And, uh, That's great, Matt, very, very well said. Thank you. Actually, Ellie said it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, well, yeah, I think that what you're doing is wonderful. Oh yeah, she's you an example. Can, she can come back with some pictures and videos and stuff. Do you have any to share? I don't. I, I, like I said, I had there's videos on YouTube of some of the work that I've done in my life, but not anything recent. And and it's taken me 10 years to write this because I had to get permission from my elders, first of all, to do it. Um, and that took that took about five years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's, well, I can't just write a book about our ways and, you know, and exploit it. It has to be, we have to talk about it with our elders to make sure that it's, a, it's an appropriate time to be sharing what we call medicine. Mm -hmm. And so this medicine is just really a way to incorporate uh, just a different point of view um, in terms of how we live our lives. Um, you know, most of us look at Maslow, for example, of how we live our lives, me, how, we, you know, the things that we need in order to have a good life. And it's sort of a triangle. 
And indigenous people don't look at triangles, they look at a circle and it starts with yourself. You have to take really good care of yourself so that you can be available to your families, so that your family can be available to community, so that community can be available to the planet. And so the way that we teach and the way that we practice is in a circle. So it's all inclusive. When you're in a triangle, it's sort of like there, you got the guy on top and then you got everybody trying to get to the top and people being stepped on. So, so it really talks about two different philosophies of how people live. And, and, um, and I just wanted to share the way that we do it because um, it's even a lot of our own people have forgotten that casinos have changed that in a lot of ways. So, so I just wanted to share that it's really meant for healing. And I actually used it. I used to be an alcohol drug counselor for um, people coming out of parole, the men. And, um, and I actually used it for them. And they really, really, really liked it. I couldn't finish it because I got deployed. But um, it stayed with me how it impacted them that I held on to these teachings that I received as a student. And so I just wanted to share it with the world and whoever can benefit from it, great. And if you can share that, great. This is, this is not about fame or money. This is about sharing a way to be well and a way to heal ourselves. Because we no, can't- love, love to have that on our website. So you have to give us some information so we can post it. Sure, thank you. Wonderful. That would be good. Thank you so much. And look, we want you to come back and share more because we're learning as, as, as we're listening to what you're saying. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation. Oh, it's my pleasure. By the so, way, uh, Connie has huh? some Native American roots as well. Yeah, and too. out of Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we do. Um, it's amazing that we have this phenomenal background, but I don't even know how to pronounce it. <laughs> 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 I, I think it's chick, chick, chick. You can help us. Uh, -uh. I have a uh, Native American in my family. My both of my grandfathers were partial uh, Cherokee Indians. Okay, it's called the Chick Tribe, tribe of Louisiana. So, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, they're there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's neat. Yeah, that's thank good you. for the world, actually. Yeah, it is. So Taylor, take it away for our next guest. Yes, ma'am. So our next guest is attorney and executive co-host, attorney and executive director of Health, a nonprofit law firm, Eric Holston, who will discuss three things seniors and individuals with disabilities struggling with debt need to know. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of who attorney Olson is, he's been an attorney for 42 years, helping seniors and those with disabilities um, and the founder of HELP, a national nonprofit law firm. HELP protects seniors and those with disabilities from collector harassment and educates them on how they can maintain their financial independence. Understanding your financial rights is extremely important. Knowing your rights will empower you. So what we will be discussing, uh, why and how seniors and those with disabilities income is protected by federal and state laws, um, that includes social security, pension, disability, and VA benefits. Uh, debt that isn't paid to collectors, what can be done as collection since demand letters. And because your income is protected, um, what do you do moving forward in terms of lawsuits or judgment? So take it away, Attorney Olson. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, Ellie, too, for that presentation about your, your sweet book. That sounds very good. So I'm thankful to be here today. Um, and if anyone has any questions or comments, you know, feel free to interrupt uh, as we go. Um, um, and thanks for that introduction. Um, so I'll just, I've been an attorney for 42 years, uh, probably filed about 30, 40,000 bankruptcies. And then noticed in my practice that seniors had had a lot of problems. Seniors, uh, a lot of seniors never realized that their income was protected. And uh, they'd come to an attorney with debt problems and uh, attorney would say, well, you don't need to worry about it, but, or 
but creditors would call and make the senior's life miserable. And they couldn't afford bankruptcy. They didn't need to file bankruptcy because their income was protected. So this really is a big problem for American seniors. Uh, several years ago, a think tank called the Economic Policy Institute uh, did a survey and found that almost half of seniors over 65 are classified as economically vulnerable, okay? And a large percentage have incomes within 2% of the poverty line. And uh, so you've got half of seniors that are doing pretty good, and then you've got half of seniors that are having financial problems. And um, there's not a lot of help for those seniors out there. Um, there are a lot of attorneys, but attorneys normally, you know, they work for money, okay? And uh, so what can these seniors do that are facing financial problems, okay? So what helps is, is a, it's a nonprofit law firm that stands for help eliminate legal problems for seniors. Our most important message to seniors is that their income is protected. Okay. Social security is protected by federal law. It can't be taken from someone. Uh, back in 1974, a law was passed called ERISA, Employment Retirement Income Security Act, that protects almost all pensions are protected under ERISA. And if it's not protected under ERISA, there's a state law that protects that pension, okay? So if a person gets Social Security a pension, that can't be touched, taken by a, a debt collector. Uh, and the same with disability income and the same with VA benefits. It's protected by federal law and, and state laws. They protect that income. And the reason it's protected is because you know, our, our, our lawmakers want our seniors to be able to have enough money for their food and their medicine, okay? But a lot of seniors don't realize that this income is protected. And, you know, if they owe debt and they don't realize that, I talked to a lot of them that, that they might go without food or medicine to pay debt they really can't afford to pay. So that's our number one message is that your, your income is protected. Now, uh, what happens if debt isn't paid? So if debt isn't paid, uh, debt collectors are going to start calling on the phone and sending demand letters. And, you know, there's not too many of us that get out of this life without having a financial problem, at least once or twice or more often or constantly during our lifetime. It just It's just part of life. Um, and owing debt can be very stressful and, and really, really really bad for people it's not good for health not good for a, a lot of things and if you don't if you're in a, a state of fear and if you're elderly it can be that much more of a problem so what happens if they don't pay debt well they can get calls and demand letters and they could be sued um and uh those kind of things so Back in 1978, a law was passed called the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And one thing that law provides is that if a collector is sent a letter called a cease and desist letter, a debt collector can no longer call that person or send demand letters anymore. They have to leave them alone. Okay. And uh, so that law is available for any senior or anyone that has debt they can't afford to pay. So if a person has protected income, they can be protected from collector harassment, okay? Um, but then what happens if uh, a lawsuit is filed? Um, if a lawsuit is filed, uh, look, so, hold on a minute here. <laughs> Don't give me my front door. <laughs> anyway, if a lawsuit is filed, you know, a, a senior could do, so they don't, if, they, if the person owes the debt, and their income is protected, and state laws protect assets, you, a lot of times you don't need to do anything. You can just, you choose not to respond to it. If someone gets a judgment, you're called what's called judgment proof. And I guess the, the third message, go ahead. So someone worries, okay, if, if someone sues me and gets a judgment, what's going to happen then? What about my bank account? Well, um, a lot. There was a real problem with seniors getting their bank accounts garnished. Okay, even though that Social Security went in the bank account, it was supposedly protected. 
creditors would sue them and get judgments and then garnish their bank accounts. Well, back in 2012, a law was passed. Actually, it wasn't. It was a federal rule went into effect that instructed banks that twice the amount of federal benefits deposited into a bank account. That would be Social Security, VA benefits. If you worked for the post office or railroad, that's a federal pension. Twice the amount of your money deposited in a bank account from a federal source each month. They told the banks, you are to automatically protect that money, that sum, regardless of what money's actually in the account. So if someone were to, if a senior were to be sued and there was a garnishment obtained against them, uh, they, nothing, uh, twice the amount. So if you got 1500 in social security, that means 3000 in your bank account is protected automatically, regardless of what funds are in there or where they came from. Uh, and I tell people sometimes, I, I haven't talked to a, a bank manager yet that understands that rule. Now, the department in a bank that handles garnishments, they know it. But if a person had a judgment and they went to their bank and they said, gee, are they going to take my money? And the bank manager say, well, yeah, if you, they can do that. But no, if it's Social Security goes in there, it's protected twice the amount. And I would guess that 999 out of a thousand attorneys don't understand that rule. It's been in effect for about 12 years, uh, but it just, it's catching on slow. The fact that that senior's money in bank accounts now is protected. So, uh, you know, that's really important information for seniors to know. Now this is the same for disabled persons, people receiving disability, their social security disability. Um, and, or if you're not, if you're a veteran receiving um, VA, disability, uh, that money's protected. And if, if someone gets a judgment that they can't, there's nothing no anyone can really do to them. And so they, uh, my, our message to seniors and people that are suffering from disability if, is if you have debt, uh, you don't use, need to use that money to, to pay, to take away from your basic needs. It's, it's available for your, for your food, for your medicine, for your heat, for your lights, for you know the things that you need. Uh, and it's important because, like I said, you know, nearly half of seniors have these problems, have have financial issues they're dealing with. Um so, so what does that mean? Well, how what's the practical effect on some of this stuff? Well, a lot of this information isn't available out there. Um, if you get on the internet, it, it's not a lot of people talk about this thing. Uh, you know, they'll may say, well, you need to file bankruptcy. Well, you don't really need to file. These people don't really need to file bankruptcy most of the time. It's, it's absolutely unnecessary. A lot of them can't afford to do it. And then uh, there's some people in here, remember consumer credit counseling? Years ago, consumer credit, before the internet, there was a thing called consumer credit counseling. There had one in every single town, okay? And, uh, when the internet came about, consumer credit counseling went away, okay? What happened was a lot of nonprofit companies came into effect, or came into being, and took over from consumer credit counseling. There's probably a, a dozen to 20 of them in existence today, you know? And what they do is they advertise on the internet and otherwise saying, we'll help people with financial problems, okay? And a lot of... Uh, some are, are for-profit, they're debt settlement companies, but then some are non-profit, they're 501c charities. But these 501c charities are kind of like the heirs of consumer credit counseling. They took the place and then they advertise all over the country about what they do. So um, the, the problem is, <laughs> How are these how are these nonprofit companies supported? Well, two ways. They charge a little fee, but the major source of income is donations they receive from the creditors on whose behalf they collect. So can these companies that collect money, these debt management companies that advertise as charitable nonprofits, uh they get when someone pays a 
someone money to them, they get a certain percentage, 10, 15, 20%, it depends, as a donation. Now, the problem with that is they have a conflict of interest. They're supposedly helping the, the senior that owes debt, but they're getting paid by the people they're collecting for. And they don't tell seniors that. And the other thing they don't tell seniors is that, well, by the way, Mr. Jones, uh, you're 68, you're on Social Security, uh, uh, you, don't need, you don't need our help because all your income is protected. It doesn't need to be used to pay debt you can't afford to pay. Now, why don't they tell them that? Well, it's pretty obvious. They were to tell them that Mr. Jones wouldn't use their services and they wouldn't, they wouldn't get paid. They wouldn't have their income. So I, I you know, they, they do a wonderful service for younger people that have jobs and are at risk, but when it comes to the elderly, uh, no, they're like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, they'll, I, I talk to people, we, it helps talk to, we have tens of thousands of clients throughout the United States. Uh, we're the only law firm that does what we do and what we do is specifically protect seniors from this collector harassment but and we so I talk to seniors all the time that are involved with that management I ask them uh, were you ever told that your income was protected and you didn't need that they you didn't need their help did they ever tell you that and they said no no they never tell didn't tell me that Ms. Olson and uh, that's the reason why so wow that you know that's our message is what we, and what what helps does is part of that law is that if a person's represented by a senior by an, if a person's represented by an attorney uh, debt collectors can't call that person so that's what helps does uh when people find out about us they call us they get enrolled over the phone uh probably half of our clients get our help for free those that pay pay an extremely small amount we don't kick anyone out of the program and we represent people ongoing so they don't have to deal with collectors but so what we do is send a letter to the collector saying hey we represent this person don't bother them anymore and then our message to our client is that they're our client ongoing if they're ever worried or scared or have a question they can always call us no matter how often can you uh, give so, us your contact information attorney olson uh well just real easy helps h-e-l-p-s nonprofit law firm but okay but we do a lot of other things too i mean uh one of our attorneys works with veterans. We help people uh, get aid in attendance. Uh, you know, there's a lot of benefit. There's benefits for veterans that a lot of veterans don't realize. And in fact, mm -hmm. that aid in attendance, there's a portion of that, like less than 3% of veterans entitled to that or their widows or widowers don't receive it because no one tells them about it. Right. So we do that. And, and then, you know, we help people in a lot of ways. Like if you have, what if you have a car you can't afford or if you got an, some have an, even have an RV they can't afford it. What happens? Or how can I, you know, we help, we have a program that's free to help clients rebuild their credit for those that are interested in doing that, that, uh, that does that. But uh, what's, your phone, of, what's the phone number? Um, well, it's, it's easy. 855 helps us, H E L P S U S, or helps us. 855 435 7787. I think Ellie's got a question there. I was going to. Yeah, actually, I do have a question. I have two, I have a whole family of, of veterans, in, in my sons and my brothers and things like that. Um, one of the things that I realized, because I also am an advocate for veterans whenever whenever people come up, is that I really see a problem between um, the VA benefits and child support and how that connects and that big disconnect between um, what child support does and because they don't talk to each other. And so it really puts a burden on, on the parent, the, the, the person who, the, the mother or the father who has to pay this child support. And there's, there's no way for these two systems to talk to, to each other. And I had to, my, my son has a brain injury. He was a Marine for 10 years. He has a brain injury. And I had to fight so, so much to, to make that happen for him. And I'm just wondering, I could not find anybody to help him with that. Um, are there attorneys who um, understand the child support system and how it affects their VA benefits? Well, you're talking about your son may have owed child support and that was being taken from his VA benefit? No, no. Um, he was paying it, um, but they went to the extent of actually taking three months worth um, at a one time, at one time. Uh -huh. um, 
Yeah, and they wrote him a letter saying that they were taking it and there was nothing he could do about it. And, and, and I resolved all that, care of all that. But there, there is There's some background noise somewhere. You know who, anyone? I don't know. I can't Tommy. hardly hear you. Someone has I mean, some mute the mic. It's Eileen. Eileen is not muted. Oh, no, it wasn't Eileen. It was, it was Wendy, she, but she muted herself. So she's okay. good. So, so I'm just wondering if there are, I just want to know if there are attorneys who deal with um, with um, child support issues and VA benefits. I mean, I my son had a, another example. My son had a, a a child support pending of which they were taking his money every month, and and they still were saying he was like fifty thousand dollars in debt. I had to pay for an attorney, and by the time it was all said and done, he didn't know anything. But he was brain injured, and he could not figure out how to express or to manage. To let them know, no, they've been taking my money. Um, Terrible. And that took me several years to take care of. But at the end of the day, he didn't owe a penny. And they were saying he owed all this money. And there was just no communication between, especially if it's in another state. So I'm just wondering if there's attorneys that deal with this specific, specifically with VA um, benefits and child support, because there's a lot of misunderstanding that happens. And I have not been able to find it. Not one. You'd have to be lucky to find someone, an attorney that would work on that for you. You'd really have to, you know, unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of problems in the law that, and that well, you know, maybe people, you have to, pe people have to, people have to help themselves in a lot of instances. And, it's, and child support can be particularly difficult when you owe child support, or if you, if they claim to owe child support, then yeah, they can, they can take up to 60% of a person's social security. And, and so, yeah, they're, they're, the law is pretty aggressive when it comes to past child support and trying to prove that you don't owe it can be difficult. You not have to go to the, you know, the court where it originally was assessed and go in front of that judge and stuff. But the, a lot of the problem is, you know, now you live in California, the divorce took place in, in Colorado or Kentucky or divorce. And so that's where the child support order is. So it can be a real headache. Yeah, um, I, just I, hate, I, hate, I, hate, I hate to interfere, I but just we wanted have to other guests. I just wanted to know if there was an attorney. I, 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 I can't hear you, something happened. I can, hear you, you? I can hear you, Connie. Okay, Ellie, I think you got muted. Did you mute yourself? I just needed to know if there was attorneys available. I understand the process very clearly because I did it myself. But yeah. I just okay. wanted to know if there was attorneys, yes or no, was kind of the question. I don't know. You'd, have to, you'd have to get lucky, Ellie. Yeah, he didn't have one. But thank you so much for that information. Okay, Taylor, take it away to our next guest. That's actually me, so... Oh, okay. That's you, Charles. Sorry. Let me introduce uh, Ann Montague. She is Ann is a Rosie's daughter and executive director of the Rosie's Movement, short for Rosie the Riveters. Many feel that the term should not include riveters, since many women who didn't rivet don't understand that their stories are sought out too. Rosie Legacy. There are people pulling together across boundaries to achieve higher goals which is based on Rosie's work and standards, fascinating stories, and the impact that they had on the war. Women's equality, their caring for veterans, and the American Rosie movement. The social movement plan that's part two of the Rosie work headed by Thanks Plain and Simple Inc., but intended for many to participate, to participate in. American Rosie movement, their phone number is 304-776-4743, and you can, uh, and I'll say that again, 304-776-4743. And their email is team at AmericanRosieMovement.org. That's team, T-E-A-M, at AmericanRosieMovement.org. Go ahead and take it away, Ann. Hello, my dear. Uh, I'm so uh, pleased at the very, very astute people in this group. And we've been uh, working with uh, Consuela now for probably 18 months or so. Can people hear me? Yeah, we hear you fine. Okay, good. That's great. Um, 
the thing that I'm going to do today is not, is atypical of of, uh, of not typical of what we typically do. Um, Consuela and the the standard uh, people in the in the group here know pretty much what I do, but let me review it for new people. Uh, starting in 2008, I uh, began to interview women who worked on the home front in World War II. I was astounded at how very, very in-depth these stories are and how broad they are in terms of their meaning for America even today. But as we've progressed making uh, documentary films, being guests of allied nations such as the Netherlands and so forth, uh, doing projects all over the country. One of the things that's happened is people have asked, who am I? Well, I'm a bit of an introvert and um, I basically don't like to brag about myself, but I've been pretty much forced in the last uh, several months to be more public about myself. So today I'm gonna tell you how I started this movement and why it ties to my own mother, who was a Rosie, and uh, where we are today. So let me also say that um, in my hesitance to be a, a, a public person, I can be public about my work, but I'm not public about myself typically. That's a personality trait from childhood. But in any event, um, Last week, I met with a producer uh, for an NBC, or uh, excuse me, public broadcasting program in New York, and he is definitely encouraging me to uh, tell my own story. So uh, that's what I'm going to do today, and I'm going to um, pull up on um, a screen share here. Excuse me. Uh, I can't, my cursor is not doing what I want it to do. Um, Sorry, Consuelo, just a minute. Oh my goodness. It says right. it's disabled screen sharing. Do you see why that is, uh, Consuelo? Uh, you have to make her a co-host. not on your side. Okay, let me make you a co-host. That's my That's fault, sorry. Okay. I didn't realize you were going to show something. Well, I did send some photos to uh, Charles, but and in fact, I had hoped to have a Rosie here today and it didn't work out, so. Yeah, Charles, you had it. That's why I didn't have her. But you, you gonna show it yourself, Ann? I'm trying, I'm sorry, I just meant. Um, well, why don't you show it, Charles, since we have other people No, waiting. don't do, do, that, do that because I've got a certain sequence that it's gonna work in. Here we go. Um, oh my goodness. I'm sorry, folks. Um, pull it up first and then uh, share. Don't share and then try to pull it up. Um, okay, I got it. My cursor is bouncing all over the place here today. Let me just go ahead and talk while I'm uh, to do a little more introduction. One of the things that uh, has been very, very important in my life is that my own mother was um, there. Um, that my own mother was not only a Rosie, but uh, she was encouraged by family members, uh, actually her sister, to abort me. And she refused. And so here I am, <laughs> 83 years old, be 84 pretty soon. And um, one of the things that I think is very important to the whole story is that my father was a World War I veteran, had seen his best friend uh, essentially literally cut in two with a chain uh, and uh, on board a ship in World War I. And he never got over that and he was aggressive. So um, my memories of my mother are very, very, very good and meaningful and solemn. At the same time, my, uh, my only mem mem memory of my father is a young child, as a little girl. I was born in 39 before we got into the war here in America. Um, my father 
I, I remember my father battering my mother and my mother putting me on a stool in a, a hallway. And I'm looking out the window and screaming for help. But I see, saw the neighbors, but nobody came. So that kind of sets a bit of a stage for the story that I'm going to tell you about. We all need a village. And Ellie's been talking about that. And I certainly will tell you that I would like to know uh, some of you better who really agree that we all need a village. Anyway, my, my mother moved in with my grandparents. And that had a great influence on me. Now realize that I'm just a wee little girl at this point. My grandfather was a room, room school teacher. He was a carpenter on the railroad. He had a, a very serious um, accident, was left deaf with missing fingers. And through the war, of course, with all kinds of uh, conserving, we had what we called a victory garden, but it was a huge um, garden out back. And with that and the chicken house, that's primarily how we got fed. Now, um, mother went to work as a, in a factory and I couldn't understand as a wee girl why she would go to work in the mornings with her head high, but come back sick almost every night, vomiting. And it turns out she was inspecting lenses on um, essentially a machine, but she was so good at it that they put her in inspecting by herself. And uh, so looking from the real world to lenses made her sick. So she came home, would vomit, uh, she couldn't eat. She was already malnourished from being in the depression. And um, so I can remember very, very well that mother and I slept in the front room of our house, uh, my grandparents' house with um, on a twin bed, even before my sister was born. And um, then when my sister was born, she was slow developing physically. She was extremely bright and a gentle person. And um, I'm very glad that I, I knew her. She eventually died of cancer and was my only sibling. So um, mother gets ready to go to work every day. She's um, so skinny that, she had no bosoms really at all. It looked like ant hills to me. And she'd put on her, uh, what we called princess slip. Then she'd choose a dress from a small closet. And of course we made everything. So she'd made her own dress. She was quite uh, a seamstress. And by the time she put on her makeup and her um, and braided her hair and all that sort of thing, she was absolutely gorgeous. And I'm gonna show you a picture of her in a minute. People thought she was a movie star. They'd stop her in the streets. Um, but she would go to work and I couldn't figure out why anybody would want a woman to go to work uh, and make her sick. And then she'd get up every day and go. And finally, I um, gradually realized that the importance of the war was more important uh, than the importance of an individual or um, even of a, of a child. Now, my grandmother was a very interesting person. I think she helped shape my, interesting. my needs to give to society. But my grandmother was a large woman. She had been part of Malungalan tribe in um, uh, Tennessee. And uh, her family had literally been run out of Tennessee. They'd walked through Kentucky and it ended up in my hometown of Huntington, West Virginia. And... Um, she was very much bothered by the fact that um, Jews and intellectuals and Jehovah Witnesses were essentially um, burned and tortured in, in Europe. She just couldn't get over it. People would knock at the door, hobos would knock at the door. She would say, we don't really, at the back door, she'd say, we don't receive our guests at the back door. Uh, what's your name? He'd say, Roy Jones. And she'd say, Mr. Jones come around front, she'd send me to go with them around front and she'd be waiting at the door and welcome them in. And uh, no matter if we didn't have food, she somehow or another would fix them a meal and uh, give them a penny postcard with her name on it and ask them to write back. So that's the kind of person uh, that uh, shaped my feelings, I think, of uh, giving more than you ask in return. But in any event, um, 
mother then, uh, when the war was over, it was a big deal. V, uh, VJ Day was a big deal. I've written a, a chapter in a book about it. Um, but um, after the war, I realized then she still had to work. So she went to work for the VA and um, she met a man there who was a lawyer for the VA. Uh, he was very distinguished looking, brought his, bought his clothing at Brooks Brothers in uh, Pennsylvania in, in Pittsburgh. But there was something wrong and I could sense it as a small child. And I was protective of other people. That's something, another personality trait of my own. And I, I felt something wrong. And I begged her not to bear, marry him. She did. And as soon as they got married, she got fired from the VA because at that time, you could not, uh, couples could not work at the same place. It was a government role. Um, so um, we moved from my grandfather's uh, home my grandparents' home, my grandfather died, and all at once we're living with a stepfather who was uh, very cruel. And um, one example that I just wrote last week is that he would uh, sit on a, a toilet in the bathroom with a high-powered rifle, shoot rats in the backyard, and I would have to stand to the side and pick up the rats and throw them in the barrel. And oh. my mother would get so distraught. And the first time I ever saw my mother distraught was in that circumstance. Um, but I kept saying to mother, now you realize at uh, this time, I'm only third grade by this time. Um, but I kept saying to mother, she was very intelligent, uh, very aesthetic, uh, was a very, very good artist. And it goes on. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a more... Um, gentle and aware person to be my mother. Uh, once That's wonderful, once, man. Once, I think what, what you're sharing is absolutely beautiful. Do you have some more, some pictures? Yes, I do, but, but, but let me go through this just a minute and I'm going to share some pictures with you. Um, now, um, my sister, uh, she was ready to go to college and my sister uh, was diagnosed as having terminal cancer. And then she knew she lost her, her chance to go to college. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures here. That's a picture of my mother. Oh, she's uh, beautiful. Mother's maiden name was Jacobs. Uh, so on her mother's side, she was Malongan, which is uh, Black, uh, African-American, and Portuguese. Uh, and uh, on her father's side, uh, he was primarily English and uh, also Jewish blood. Um, so I'm quite a mix. Here's the home that we lived in. If you see the porch there, when I was a child, this is a more recent picture, but when I was a child, there was no, um, there was no banister there. And I would stand on the porch with the top step and watch her go out the gate. And then she would turn, it would be to your right there. And I didn't ever see the factory. At that time, I didn't have any idea where that factory was. I just knew it was on a hill somewhere. She and I slept in uh, behind this oak tree, which was 100 years old when I was a child. And um, uh, in the very, very back and in the side here, we had chicken houses and, and um, uh, garden. Um, now, when it came down to it, um, and this is a really, really change in my life that I never got over. Uh, my stepfather was seriously cruel. There was no doubt about it. And by the way, this is one reason I'm interested in this group, because he was a person who decided who got vet veterans benefits. So he was a lawyer in the adjudication division of the VA. And uh, he and a, a doctor would decide who got VA benefits. And I'm not going to go into cruel examples, but it, it was bad. And I, I, at that point, started having a very um, keen questioning of why would a veteran be, be um, aggressive like my, my own father was it because he saw war and what were people doing about that? And why would you laugh? And why would somebody who's supposed to be give them benefits laugh at people who were messed up? 
physically or spiritually or mentally from being in, in uh, battle. So for whatever it's worth. Uh, so my um, stepfather, um, and by the way, I never met his family in the whole many years they were married, I never met his family. But um, my stepfather wouldn't even talk to mother about letting her go to college. And uh, we moved into a huge house on the edge of town, very spooky house actually. And at uh, um, one point mother had a baby. Uh, and then a few months later, she was filing for divorce. So okay. the, date, wow, that's amazing, man. The, the date of the divorce papers came, she went insane. And I'm saying to you very loudly and very clearly, she wasn't just emotionally disturbed, she was insane. And wow. that was an extremely important day in my life. And that's written in some of the, the text here. But uh, from that- so this, is a, this is a book that you're coming out with, right? I don't know. I am, right now, I'm getting ready to tell it on public radio. Okay. Anyway, the point, the point, I, is, the point is that uh, all my life then from losing her to mental illness, I had this great need to reconnect to people like my grandparents, to people like my sister who died, to, to people like my mother. And I, no matter that I got a master's degree at Harvard and did all kinds of, um, you know, technology transfer and all that, I was very, um, and there was a void. So in Boston, um, well, let me go back. So I, I go to Japan uh, to make a transition from being a parent to being alone. And um, in, uh, I'm in Tokyo. And uh, I come in one night, it was very cold and damp and um, miserable evening. It was dark and I grabbed the mail, it was November. And I had been there since August to, to teach English for a year. And um, when I went in the bathroom, I saw a letter from home. I was very pleased, even though I didn't have a relative, any relative who was kind to me. Uh, yeah. That uh, in that letter was uh, my mother's notice of her death. She'd been buried for a whole year, I mean, a whole month, and I had not been notified. So, the important, so this, this is the important piece of the story. That's uh, amazing. I, man. I, I want you to share more, but we're running out of time. Well, I, can you tell I, us a little bit about what you're doing with the roses before well, we have to move on? Let me just finish this because this is the peak of the story. I'm standing there with this letter in a six to Tommy Matt apartment, and I'm shocked to find that mother had died and had been buried and I hadn't been notified. And I looked up and that same picture that I saw you right there, that's the way I saw her. Uh, she was right there in the room with me up on the left-hand corner of this small room. And I knew that mother was uh, going to be with me as I went forward somehow in my life and somehow for people to know her and other people as they really are before something horrid happens to them, okay? So that's a key piece of the story. Now, in Boston, I um, decided that I was gonna work with uh, older people to, to get to know them and to, bring some sort of comfort to myself. And I uh, then did came back to West Virginia, started the Rosie Movement. And in the Rosie Movement, uh, I started interviewing the women. Uh, this is the first woman I interviewed. Her name's Garnet Kozelik. She lived in a, a very sweet, uh, but unassuming uh, neighborhood in Dunbar, West Virginia, you know, not famous and known by anybody. And, um, I had a mannequin ordered uh, and a videographer there uh, that day. And she was so thrilled to open this. She had riveted airplanes in Michigan and in California, wingtips of, of uh, bombers. And she opened this and there was that naked body, you know, with a head and boobs there. And the first thing she did is pull it out and say, uh, hey, babe, 
my boobs is bigger than yours. And we laughed and she dressed that, that mannequin and we still have that mannequin that's at my dining room table. Um, so yeah, from that yeah. point on, we started then doing projects. It's not enough to get the stories of the women. That's not good enough. That doesn't involve the public. So the big, the big piece of our work is we involve the public in doing something that lets the, the um, public be part of passing on the Rosie legacy on a permanent basis you know, from now into the future. So this is one of the first projects we did. The women chose the land. Um, they designed the park. It's an oval because oval represents democracy. The tree here is a dogwood tree. They went to a lot of uh, worry and thought about what species of tree and it goes on. Then, um, and the, the group here that is with Connie most of the time knows about a ring a bell for roses. This lady made uh, tires in Akron, Ohio, and that's at the National Cathedral in Washington. This is an uh, ambassador of the Netherlands with a, a woman who was um, Filipino and a woman uh, who was from Louisiana. Uh, this is a recent poster that was done. It was done by people in the Netherlands. This lady here in pink is um, fr from the Netherlands. This is a statue that they have there. And this is a little uh, American uh, Girl Scout who was a brownie at the time. She's now 14 and she rang the first bell for Rosie's. And here's a picture then of uh, Connie because uh -huh. the group here uh, has rung bells for Rosie's. And so far they, the close and the thing that I want to leave, leave all of you with is that um, when people would ask me early on why I was doing it and why I would not, I have never been paid over the 15 years I've been doing this work. And I live very modestly. I do not have luxuries. I don't even, I can't afford a car. I can drive. I'm disabled, but I can drive, but I can't afford a car. And they say, but why? And I used to say, because it was the right thing to do. And I believe that, but now more recently, people are saying to me, Anne, you've got to tell your personal story. You're, you're telling a personal story of the Rosies, but your own story is part of the Rosies story. And it is. one of the things that I want to leave with all of you, and especially the new people to the group, because the people that we've I've been working with here in this wonderful group over 18 months or so, pretty much now, but that um, we, we know, we talk about all the time that we need to unify, but nobody says, how are we going to do it? I honestly believe that the American Rosie Movement will get people involved. They will be uh, able and willing to work across different boundaries. Look, look at me, I'm in West Virginia and you're all out there in Los Angeles or wherever you are. And we will work across boundaries. And it's not just um, physical boundaries, but all the other boundaries, religious and so forth. And we've proven that we are doing that. And we're naming schoolrooms. And uh, all of the um, United States will be targeted for naming schoolrooms for Rosies if they really learn the, the real legacy of these women. So the point is that um, the, we're all looking for a place in the world. And we are uh, not only people looking for places in the world, but our, our country being a very prominent democracy is looking for a place to know who are we really. I think if we find within ourselves who we really are, like my revealing to you a story that I've never told to anybody before today, uh, know who you are and know that you have a place in the world and know that if you have a place in the world and can work with others across all these different boundaries, then we will know who we are as a nation. And thank I Thank you, that's thank, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I cannot thank Consuela enough. I, I can tell you truly that um, I you. feel that it was meant to be that I would find somebody who, um, 
his love to Rosie's almost as much as I do. I don't think anybody loves them as much as I do because I know them so well. But I, I just am so uh, and eternally grateful for the, the help that we're getting. And I do not know exactly how we're going to work together. I've been trying to figure it out because I want to fit with, with your uh, mission, Consuelo, you know, with homeless veterans and all that. Right. But we're going to do it. it. It will fall into place. It will come. Yeah, it will. Yeah. Well, thank it's you all, so much. It's, it's falling into place right now. Yes, and it I is. also want to compliment uh, Charles because I feel that Charles is a disabled veteran. Um, I mean, not all of his disability comes from being a veteran, but I think that Charles is a disabled veteran, uh, has a wonderful spirit. Doesn't he? Doesn't he have a wonderful spirit? Oh, yeah. Bring back and the screen, the you, full you screen. You all are an example of what we can do uh, if we quit thinking negatively and say, the rose, rosy means good. You know, some, some, everything's coming up roses. Um, the American Rosie movement is positive, and we call it that because it's positive. Uh, and that's what we need to do is put a positive spin. It doesn't mean we're not going to have to work like Trojans. We have to work. We, it's not easy, especially with government bureaucracy and all that. But well, thank you so much, for my girlfriend. You know how much we love you. Can you give your contact information again? We have several people still waiting. Okay. It's 304-776-4743. And the email is um, team, T-E-A-M, at American Rosie, R-O-S-I-E, movement.org. And give that number out again. 304-776-4743. Uh, Since we have radio listeners now, two podcast listeners, we have to. Make sure you repeat it several times. Well, you know, we just absolutely love you and the roses. We've been so honored to have had them on. I mean, we're talking 90 and 100 year old girls, but they were absolutely fabulous. Can you bring back the full screen now? Yes, I will. Thank you so much. And, so uh, been, what'd you say, Charles? Uh, I want to say thank you, Ann, for, uh, you know, that uh, kind uh, uh, compliment. You know, I just, uh, my my thing is I like to pass it on to people. It's like you know, as in uh, uh, a whole lot of things I've been through in life. I'm still here. Um, yeah, and and you're you know, one of my heroes. Life. I have a lot of heroes. Just a second, you're, Elaine, you're, can you, you mute? Are top we can hear you. I promise you. Can you mute for a second? We can hear. Okay. There you go. All right. So what were you saying, Anne? You muted now too. I was mm -hmm. talking about Elaine, not you. Unmute yourself, and we can't hear you. It won't, you can't get it back. You muted, Ann. She don't know how. Do you sure. want me to just press forward with introducing our next guest? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. Thank well, you, thank Ann. you, Ann, for Appreciate a wonderful you. presentation. So our next guest today is Ms. Eileen Smolson who is the founder and CEO of Operation Blankets of Love that began in 2008. Their mission is to provide, or their issue, excuse me, is to improve the health of homeless animals and increase their chances for survival and adoption. They collect, transport, and distribute pet food and recycle and new blankets, pet beds, towels, treats, toys, and other comfort care items and bring them to shelters rescue groups, pets of the homeless, low-income seniors with pets, homeless veterans, and foster serving 12,000 animals annually, my Atlanta. Her husband, Brad, is the director of operations and the head of their Pets of the Homeless program. They have been featured on national TV, radio animal shows, magazine, and news stations, and received 45 awards for their life-saving work. Take it away, Eileen. Hi, thank you. Get your sound up. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes? we can hear you. Okay, okay Brad, get into oh, the picture. Hi. 
Yeah, it's high. Hi, it says Hi. get in the picture, I get in the picture. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's Connie, thank you. It's an honor to be part of this um, panel and your podcast. And we do so much with the veterans and uh, it all started just helping a, a local shelter when I saw puppies freezing on the cement. Oh. And I found out that there's no budget for any blankets or bedding throughout uh, the United States when there's city and county shelters. So I, I asked, what can I do? Because I couldn't picture my, my first rescue dog in that situation. And they said, see if you can collect from the community. So that's what we did. And we started with one shelter. Now we're up to 114 shelters up and down California and Mexico that we give the blankets and towels to, to the animal shelters. But I'm the kind of person that I like to think out of the box and, and keep going. So I heard about the pets of the homeless and that um, a lot of the homeless have pets and that's their only family. And so I um, called a couple of organizations that help the homeless on the streets. And I found out that they didn't have a budget for any pet items. So I said, well, we'll give it to you. So that started over 10 years ago. And now we help about 80 organizations that go out to the homeless. And um, they, if they have pets, we we um, give them everything they need. And Brad is going to tell you more about it because then we found out they have a program okay. of the VA with the veterans with pets, not only homeless veterans with pets, but um, vet, vets that had um, had a service animal and they were um, they had a home, but they didn't have a lot of funds. So we said, okay, we're going to do something to help those veterans. So I'm going to give this to Brad because he's in charge of that particular program, the Pets and the Homeless and the Veterans with Pets. And since that's what we're all about in this particular um, podcast, I, I don't want to talk about our other programs. Um, we can touch upon that. We can what touch upon a yeah, little bit. We got we so have, much to talk about and I, yes, in a small have, amount of time. Everybody's not a veteran, so please share your yeah. other programs you have so, as well. So you can think of this organization as a Red Cross to the animal rescue world. Gotcha. And we rescue the rescuers. They come to us. I've got shelters and rescues and organizations that help uh, people in need, uh, that have homeless, pets. that have pets. We work uh, closely with the VA. We work on the stand down days. If anybody's familiar with stand down days across the country. Uh -huh. Yeah. So what we would do, like uh, we have a stand down day of in Los Angeles, um, November, usually uh, before Veterans Day. Where what was it held at the homeless. convention center? What's that? Where was it? That at was over in West LA. Okay. You know, over by the hospital, but on, oh. across from the hospital where the okay. residential side is. Okay. So what we'll do is uh, we'll be there with uh, dozens and dozens of organizations that are that help with services, whether they be um, uh, medical or, um, or any kind of financial aid or whatever it is. So what we do is we show up with maybe about 1,500 pounds of supplies for the veterans in need, uh, mainly pet supplies, because that's what we specialize in. Um, and we had probably about 500 veterans come to our booth and we gave all the supplies. We had blankets for both oh, pets wow. and for the folks. We had hygiene for the folks. Hygiene kits. Hygiene kits um, and pet food and toys for the pets. So in essence, we're, we're kind of like a quartermaster so that when called upon for supplies and food, We'll either show up or have it available to organizations like the VA. Uh, they can come to our facility and load up with what they need. Um, gotcha. We used to have a food pantry, a pet food pantry over at the West Side, but unfortunately, that whole pandemic situation uh, kind of put us back a couple of years because they had a change of personnel. We would show right. up there every once in a while. We'd have a special room and put our supplies in 
but unfortunately people either retired from it or they changed um, positions or whatever it is. So you get kind of lost and I'm trying to restart that, jumpstart the idea of having supplies available for veterans in need. At the, at the, VA, at the VA buildings, yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, so that's, you know, like I said, we're a quartermaster to not only the sheltering system, uh, to the rescue world, but also organizations like the VA. So when called upon, we'll give them the supplies that they need. Now, I do humane education uh, classes. I used to be a teacher. And there's no humane education classes or curriculums, even though there's a bill that the school is supposed to have something about it. They just don't do it. So I started my own. And um, I teach the children about the problem of overpopulation of, of shelters. But that's not just the whole thing. I teach how to be kind to animals, how to be a responsible pet owner. But then the kids have to, it's from preschool all the way to high school, they have to collect gently, uh, gently used or new blankets and towels or anything pet related because they're going to be part of the solution. So then the school or the Girl Scout troops or Eagle Scouts or youth groups, or we even go to like Kiwanis clubs, they will they will do a collection drive where I'll get hundreds of items and then we will give them out. But what's important about the humane education, I, I tell them about the pets of the homeless, that one of their blankets could go to, a, to an animal that's living on the street with their owner and how special that is. And right. so they they feel they feel so good that they're helping not only the people that are caring for the animals, but of course, the animals themselves. Um, we have some photos uh, that I want you to show, Charles, of um, us with the veterans giving out things. Do you have that? I do. Um, OK, and I know we have a video. I don't know if you can see the what, what would you like to do first, the video or the photos? Um, I'll show the video and then okay. uh, then I'll show some photos. Well, I'll show you the photos right now first, and then okay. we'll. Okay. So. And Brad can describe a little bit what what you see. Okay, that's that's me. Um, we gave pet clothes for the little dog. Okay, and um, also, of course, a lot of them don't have who are homeless don't have leashes or collars, and they're just walking the dog on the street. So it's important that they know you need a collar with an ID and a leash. So we give that out as well, Brad. Um, well, uh, obviously you have, a somebody, um, at an active duty that has their child. So we'll have, maybe we'll have some toys available for families. Uh, we always have that on, on hand for the children, for the children. So we have items, not only for people, pets, but also children. So that's a, a little box of, um, of, uh, looks like pet supplies and knickknacks that we gave out. This goes back a couple of years ago over at the West LA uh, VA. And this, what else there is. this was recently, I think. Oh, there's our friend. There she is. Uh, this is our friend that comes up. She's a, a veteran. She lost her leg and, uh, and she has her pup. And I always spoil this woman with all sorts of love and supplies. And um, let's see if we can tilt down a little bit. There she is with, you can see one of her legs are gone. So uh, whenever I see her, I just uh, give her hugs and uh, load her cart up with all sorts of pet supplies and uh, food and whatever she needs, we provide that. And th so this was, uh, these photos here, this is a, you can see somebody in a wheelchair coming up to our booth. And um, well, you know, there's a lot of uh, disabled veterans that come around um, and we'll help them as well. So this, that... was, uh, this was uh, in November. Mm -hmm. So you can see all the supplies, look at all the boxes of all sorts of stuff, whether it be pet related or supplies for the folks. And we just give everything away. And it's an honor to be called upon the VA to make sure that uh, that we're, we have a presence there. And uh, there we go, more of our veteran friends and as a happy service person and her pup has got uh looks like some pet clothes yeah new outfit a new outfit so um so this is yeah there and there's the the booth 
So let's see what else. I, yeah, so that just gives you a smidgen. So that gives you an idea on the stand down days. Okay. And um, let's see if we can get the, we have the video happening. Yes. Okay. Yep, there's always a commercial going on. But uh, we're active every single day in the rescue world. We probably work an average of six days a week. And um, uh, the mornings are devoted to helping rescues, shelters, organizations that help. Uh, pets of the homeless, veterans, and oh, here, what's this? Eyes, including blankets, food, and collars. But one organization, pets that end up in shelters often go without critical supplies, including blankets, food, and collars. But one organization in Granada Hills is helping to make a big difference in their lives. North San Fernando Valley community journalist Amanda Palacios introduces us to a nonprofit that's helping out in a meaningful way. When Granada Hills resident Eileen Smolson first visited an animal shelter, she noticed the dogs inside the cages were shivering on cold, hard cement with no blankets. So she decided to help, collecting hundreds of blankets to give to the shelter. But Eileen quickly learned rescue organizations and shelters needed more than just blankets. In about one month, I collected a few hundred items. I thought, wow, this is my calling, and I made into a nonprofit. That's when Eileen and her husband Brad created Operation Blankets of Love. The nonprofit mainly operates out of a storage facility in Mission Hills and has been helping rescue groups for the past 15 years by donating food, aid, and comfort supplies. It's humbling to help people every single day, and that's what drives us to wake up every morning. Officials with Operation Blankets of Love say when organizations come for donations, they receive supplies like crates, dog food, toys, and even collars. On average, the nonprofit gives up to $1,000 worth of items to each group that shows up. We love them. They help us and they help tons of groups. WUFA is traveling to Cambodia and Vietnam very soon and we need supplies to help the animals there. It's unbelievable, it's shocking that you can come here and get pretty much everything and anything you want. And because we do focus on the medical oh. dogs, it, it really saves us a ton of money. Operation Blankets of Love has over 20 drop-off locations and relies heavily on community donations. We're looking for dog and cat food, wet and dry, treats, blankets, pet beds, and collars and leashes and harnesses. For more information, visit obol.info. So you can see a little bit of uh, a day in the life of Operation Blankets of Love. What are you doing? I'm looking at my new Toyota. Look yeah. at Another commercial, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Commercials. Well, that is absolutely beautiful. And I would like everyone to know that I'm hoping to have a little friend to show everyone next week, thanks to Blankets of Love, because <laughs> I want my little, little precious little dog, and I think that Brad and Eileen is very responsible for me, hopefully to be able to show my little my little friend next week. Hopefully, if not, it'll be a couple of weeks. Yeah. Thank you That's so wonderful. much. Yeah. I mean, it's very important to let to let you all know that um I go to schools from Pacoima uh, to a private school because everyone hopefully will have at least a recycled towel that they can bring in. You don't have to go to a private school to have a recycled towel. One kindergarten, they were giving up their little nappy blankets, all the oh. little kids and um, for, for the animals. Um, and here's the workbook that Eileen made. It's in Spanish and English on oh, pet wow. care and responsibility. Oh, and, wow. um, and so we send these we sent these throughout the Southwest, California, Mexico. Uh, we sent it as far down to Peru, Puerto Rico. Recently, we sent 80 to um, the La Jolla um, Indian, Indian Reserv Reservation. So we're involved with, with, uh, with that as well. So these get sent all over the, the uh, states and beyond. And it's a learning tool. And we love this. Yeah, yeah we passed out um, about 8,000 already. Um, really? coloring, yes, um, coloring um, activity workbooks, and because it's in Spanish, my my dream is to have it in different languages, all so we can do that. And I get corporate sponsorship, individuals, for so I can give out 
all these books at no cost. See, the top oh. is in English and the bottom is in Spanish. That is so care and responsibility. And it's 48 pages. So it's, oh it's my not, goodness. yeah. And I'm doing one right now. I'm going to include uh, probably four or five more pages. And it's everything you ever want to learn how to be kind to animals and how to be a responsible pet owner. So hopefully they won't be left in um, on the streets, dumped in the shelter. Um, right. like garbage and it's really really sad but we're so glad that we're able to help the the veterans in fact we were very honored um this veterans day to get an award you want to tell them about it, that where's the picture here huh no it's up there that's not um it does no that's oh yeah it is. this is this was in here i don't know if you could see that that was over at the west lost west no, it's kind of hard. veterans day they invited us they gave us an award and they invited us to speak. And that was an honor. That was West Hollywood. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, we also helped in Long Beach, Ventura County. Where else did stand we? down days? Yeah. yeah. Different. We've been to different cities in different years to give out everything. And one of our assistants who, who um, helps us, he also found a place that gave shirts and socks and um, backpacks. So we give that out as well to the well, veterans yeah, so, we, we, okay. to, we, our supplies end up in many areas that help uh people in need so we you know we work with many organizations we'll never turn them down and well the thing is this that we all work together the idea is working together with other agencies if we have something that they need they'll contact us they'll pick it up and vice versa. So it, it really works well in Los Angeles and in Southern California. Yeah, we we work uh, very closely with with probably like with it's, dozens of organizations. It's like a village, right? Yeah, really. It's like a village. There we well, go. At least, yeah. and Brad, I know that you all are very busy, but we really hope that you would consider having a segment on at least once a month and showing what you're doing. I mean, if you have the time, we would love to. Well, you're going to come over, come over for lunch and we'll do a Zoom here and we'll all that eat. Not, you know, I got to make those samples. Really? Bring your pup and let's go. Let's, <laughs> your new pup. Yeah, yeah. when I get it, <laughs> I sure yeah, will. Yeah, you get it. And then I'll spoil it. I'll give you pet beds. I'll give you some food. I'll give you leashes, collars, whatever you need. We'll give oh, us a you be an HR puff and stuff, see? Yeah. There you go. So if anyone's looking for um, a dog or a cat, and we also help wildlife. Um, we farm animals. Farm animals. Here I am kissing pigs. Look. Oh, no. I don't know. I got, I got my face muddy. Here see that? Oh. You kissing so, the pig? Uh, yeah, that's a pig, a pig pen. So, you know, I, I climbed oh, in the Oh, they were kissing. It. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, we deal with wolves and coyotes and uh, raccoons and all sorts of sanctuaries. Bunny rescues because they need towels. In fact, raccoon rescue, they eat dog food. So we, we oh, wow. uh, and, some coyote, and coyotes do too. Yeah, they eat the dog food. So we get tons of dog food. So we just give it away. As much the uh -huh. more we get, the more we give away. Yeah. Okay. And so oh, I'm God. a professional fundraiser, everybody, for 30 oh, years. Oh God, I need you, girlfriend. You can't okay, say well, that's the best on. words you could have said. <laughs> okay. And you know, for people charities, the first one was the American Cancer Society. But um, so when I when I started this, believe it or not. I, it was because an inspiration of um, a mutt that I adopted in 2003, and I never had a pet in my life. I had no idea what to do with this dog. And um, that was this one. That oh, was here. that little dog here that we found. Yeah. This little dog was abandoned on a highway in Palmdale. And so, so that, that little dog changed our life and actually. Um, steered us into the direction of helping others right so um, so if you need help you call me connie and i'll give you some I'm ideas. Send you an email so you can see exactly to the extent of what operation conference is doing for our veterans okay and i'll look we at your definitely website. need you on board yeah <laughs> please do and, and i would like to put your information on the website i'd like to give you a whole page so send us something that I can post on the website as well. I think that will be great. And um, we can put something as um, you to put your charity as one of our partners too under our page with partners that we have. We work oh, a God, lot yeah. with politicians that love um, 
that love animal rights and we'll find out which ones love the veterans. I'm sure you you already do that, right? Politicians that help veterans, right? I'm sure. I try to, to a, to yeah. a degree, but we want to make make that happen even more so hopefully with your support and help right what year did you start what year did in, you start your nonprofit? In the year one <laughs> the year one yeah oh boy is that 2001 i don't know oh. but no listen, for our veterans i'm going to make people. some lunch if anybody wants to stop by i'm making those sandwiches okay, okay. so you're all invited <laughs> and i'll let her finish up no i think that's no it. our veteran no. program started in 2009 Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Almost but the organization good. has been around for several decades. Right. Oh, okay. We'll have to hear yeah. more about that. Yeah. Well, our phone number, if anyone wants to contact us, is 818-402-6586. That's 818-402-6586. And our website is o. B as in blanket, O L as in love, dot info, obol dot info. And you can see all the information, I'm very detailed, um, of what you would like to help us help the veterans, help help people who have pets in need. And I want to thank you all. And you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. Thank your, you. your presentation, you and Brad were just amazing. Don't forget, you have a a monthly invitation, my girlfriend. <laughs> Think about it. I know you're busy, but you have a lot to share and a lot of better you want to reach. Thank oh, you thank so you. much. Thank you. Okay. Our, yes. Do we have one more? Or we have the last? Oh, my goodness. I hear you. Okay. okay. Taylor, you want to take it away? Yes, ma'am. So our next co-host is Dr. Wendy Childress. She is a retired Army chaplain having served in the Army and the California Army National Guard. She has served as an associate pastor and worked in the nonprofit sector in various capacities for over 15 years. Reverend Wendy Childress is a life coach and the founder of Living Life Completely, LLC. A lifelong student herself, Dr. Wendy is a firm believer that education is essential and it is not confined to the traditional halls of academia. With this understanding, she sees knowledge as a tool that allows the individual to live life completely. Therefore, Dr. Wendy thought is befitting for Black History Month to honor veterans and those still in uniform who are investing in educating the minds of our children. In honor of Black History Month, Dr. Childress will give a tribute to African-American educators. But before you do, ma'am, would you please give us a short prayer? Thank you, Taylor. Uh, hopefully you all can't hear all the noise in the background. Yeah, we can. Okay, well, I apologize for that. I'm at a cafe. I had to pull over and oh, set up uh, camp right here. Um, I'm at a restaurant, so I can't control the noise. So right. I will be quick. And I will open this a prayer, and hopefully the noise is not too loud. I try to uh, uh, fade it out with the noise control, but that doesn't seem like that helped too much. So <laughs> here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, first of all, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for keeping us throughout the night and waking us up this morning, because we know you alone did that. Father, we thank you for all the lives of all the veterans their families that have given their time and their life and their energy and their years to serve this country. Father, we just ask that you watch over us. And we ask that you comfort those families that are dealing with the earthquakes and, and wars and everything else. And we just ask for your mercy, your comfort, and your peace. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Can't hardly hear you. You can't hear me? Now I can hear you. Yeah, it's a little better. That's better? Mm-hmm. How about that? Yeah, that's, that's better. better. Uh -huh. Okay, so I will be brief. I will need to share my screen. And so... Second. 
There we go. And as Taylor said, I thought it only be fitting for African American History Month to honor our veterans that are educators. And I'm only going to do a few. However, I'm going to start with just this page, just on education. Or as I'm talking, you all can read those quotes. Several months ago, I was sitting and I was watching the news and I actually had to gasp because the news anchor said that the education system across the country is in such dire need and of educators and actually in peril as well that they were Dr. Wendy, I'm yes. sorry to cut you off, but we can't hear you very well. And this is so important. Are you oh. going to be able to come back and share this next week as well? You know what? Let's do that. I can do that. Yeah, because we can't hear you. And this is very important. OK, let's just make it for next week. OK, that'd be wonderful. So if you want to have anything to close out, we still love you. you How's you know your retreat doing? Oh, those are well. Those are well. We have one coming up on uh, March 30th through the April 2nd. We're doing a spa retreat. And for those of you who do not know what Connie is referring to, she was referring to a organization that I co-founded with my daughter for African-American women. And we work on wellness, education, um, health, spiritual, the complete packet in uplifting and edifying African-American women. And so we have a spa retreat coming up, as I said, March 30th through April 2nd. Okay, you have some pictures to share with us for sure. Yes, I'll and have. And video, some. right. Yes. Thank you so much. Sorry we couldn't hear you very no, well. No, that's okay. That's okay. I'd rather it be heard than not heard. So we'll do right. it next week. Yeah, good. It's on you, Charles. Oh, is it now? Uh, all right. Uh, Monique, it is your time. Monique Mann is an actress, dancer, producer, health and wellness advocate with over 30 years experience in the entertainment industry, most notably as the dancer and Princess Kiss This video. Coming to America with Eddie Murphy and Spike Lee's school days, to name a few. In 2009, she was under a lot of stress that manifested as out of control eczema, skin outbreaks like hives and her armpits felt like they were on fire. So in Hollywood, hmm, fire, so in, okay. Say, it took three long years to find a, well, go ahead, my, my, uh, Monique, I'm gonna let you tell it because Take it away. Are you with us? Yes, I am. All yeah, right. it took me to. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. And it's I'm 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 love being a student from to hear everybody's story, and I'm very inspired. Uh, but yeah, it took me three years to find a healthy solution. And then when you in Hollywood out for three years, I literally went from hot to not just like that. And uh, so uh, I have made it my mission because there are too many people suffering in silence. Uh, with their health issues. And I'm on a mission to help change that and to also help uh, people to become their own health advocate, what I had to do, because for three years, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll try that. Yeah, I'll try that. Yeah, I tried it. And wanted to try. I wind up in the hospital uh, because I had a severe allergic reaction and they put me steroids in the drip system, sent me home with a 10 day supply of pills of steroids and steroid cream. Still didn't know what was wrong with me. So uh, if anything, at a minimum, take away from what I'm sharing is become your own health advocate. If a doctor or anybody tells you you have to take this, do you research? What is it? What are the side effects? So then make a decision if you want to put that in your body, right? Because sometimes the side effects are worse than what you're dealing with. So you have to go like this right? Or find out what is an alternative that I can use. And also read labels, what you put inside your body. Read what's in the label. If you can't pronounce it, don't put it in your body. Simple as that. Same thing with, with uh, products, with products, uh, shampoo, conditioner, body lotion. Our skin is our biggest organ. 
especially this is the most dangerous part with shampoo and conditioner that have like ingredients in it that causes dementia, that causes brain injury because 60% gets absorbed into our skin. And here it's close to your brain, boom. So we don't want to have to happen. And then Charles, um, so I got introduced by Dr. Chesney who the chief of cardiology in Centennial Hospital with his new signs that somebody shared with me. They were like, Monique, I'm, you got to come. You have, this will help you. And uh, he introduced me to this new science. Sanjay Gupta wrote about this new science in his book, eight pages in his book, Chasing Life, a book on new health discoveries. And uh, when I heard the information, I'm like, wow, I think this will help me. And I got on it. And two weeks later, my husband looked at me. He was like, whoa, give me some of that. Because it, because he saw me struggle for three years. And then within two weeks, it just literally changed my life. And so that's what my mission is. It's like, look, there's option. And here's an option that I would love to share with people that changed my life and hopefully will change as, as uh, yours as well. I have a private Facebook group page called uh, Buy Hacking Room. And I post a testimonial or a study or a research or help uh, uh, every day, every single day, because it's so many people struggling and suffering with health. And so Charles, if you can show the video about what this NRF2 activation is, because it's the future of health. The National Institute of Aging did a 10 year, over 10 year, over decade study on because the government knows that we are in trouble, that we're in trouble with the environment. And it's because people be getting sicker and sicker, right? And then a lot of people are put on so many medication. This, it's so heartbreaking to see that you see people on 18 up different medication and one medication causes another problem, another medication causes another problem and it's a vicious circle and it got to stop. Remember the story of Godzilla and how a monster lizard was created by a nuclear reaction and then destroyed entire cities? If so, do you know there are mighty raging Godzillas living inside your body right now, destroying everything they can get their hands on, and you may not even be realizing it? But let me explain. There is an internal struggle going on inside our bodies all day and night between free radicals, the bad guys, and antioxidants, the good guys. Free radicals are like many Godzillas. They've come for one purpose, to wreak havoc and destroy everything they can. Antioxidants, on the other hand, are like our personal superheroes, unleashed to go fight these bad guys by neutralizing the Godzilla-like free radicals. You've probably heard all the buzz about antioxidants, right? Well, here's how it's supposed to work. When we were born, our bodies came equipped to protect us from the harmful effects of free radical damage. For every one free radical inside our body, there should be at least one antioxidant waiting, ready to neutralize and de-arm it before it can wreak havoc. There's just one problem. The world we live in now is not the world our bodies were designed to live in. Air pollutants, processed foods, pesticides, even the oxygen we breathe in to survive all create tons of harmful free radicals into our system. And at this current alarming rate, our bodies are just not designed to keep up with it. I'll prove it. Almost all the foods we've been eating that are considered good for us have antioxidants, right? A bowl of oatmeal has about 2,100 antioxidants, so it can neutralize 2,100 free radicals. And a half cup of wild blueberries has about 2,900 antioxidants, neutralizing 2,900 free radicals. A cup of coffee has a whopping 15,000 antioxidants, but the toxic world we live in today is causing our bodies to actually be battling against, ready for it? up to 300 sextillion free radicals every single day. Yep, that's 300 with 21 zeros behind it. Godzilla's running rampant inside your body right now. And there are way, way too few antioxidants to offset them. The scariest part? This insane excess of free radicals causes something called oxidative stress. In case you don't know, tens of thousands of studies have now connected oxidative stress to nearly every health concern you can think of. In other words, if your body can't neutralize these free radicals and stop the Godzillas from destroying everything in their path, you are almost sure to deal with major health problems and age way, way faster than you should. Not fun, right? No amount of eating even the most antioxidant-rich fruits and veggies or grabbing one of those drinks that says antioxidant on the label can fix this. That's like tossing a pebble at Godzilla. Good luck! Right now, what's happening is there are millions and millions of Godzillas running through your body, and your body's natural defense is just not designed to fight them off at this rate. Your body is shooting BBs at giant monstrous lizards, and isn't even making a dent. Meanwhile, the Godzillas are attacking your cells just like they toppled whole cities in the movies, causing inflammation and damage. 
It's all making sense, isn't it? You're getting this, right? The brain fog, the pain in your joints, horrible sleep patterns, the lack of energy. It's all Godzilla's fault. Now I know what you're thinking. Geez, Cartoon, this is horrible news. Why did you just ruin my day? Hang on. What if I told you there was something that you could do about it right now? You can. Your body actually has the ability to create its own antioxidants. Some of these superheroes have the ability to neutralize up to 100,000 free radicals every second in every cell of your body. Whoa! Remember a cup of coffee at 15,000 antioxidants? That's like throwing a Dixie cup of water on a house fire. Why do we take antioxidants through fruits and drinks that are like tossing pebbles and useless vitamin tablets when your body was designed to create your own, like calling up mighty superheroes? It's because up until recently, there wasn't a safe and effective way to deploy more good guys. Until now, there's been a legitimate breakthrough discovery in the little protein we have tucked inside every cell of our body that actually holds the key to defeating the millions of Godzillas. And that protein is called Nerf 2. See, Nerf 2 functions like a command center, and when our oxidative stress is high and free radicals are overtaking our body, Nerf 2 tells our cells to unleash more of these superheroes. This technology is so intriguing that Washington State University recently published a study on Nerf 2 activation and went on to conclude that Nerf 2 may well become the most extraordinary therapeutic and preventative breakthrough in the history of medicine. That's amazing, isn't it? If we could just turn on the Nerf 2 pathway, it would be like unleashing all the superheroes to destroy the gods Godzilla's wreaking havoc on the city. So how do we activate our Nerf 2 pathway to begin feeling better today? Well, we know that dietary antioxidants just aren't equipped to battle against even a few Godzillas, let alone millions and millions. But what if I told you you could have a direct access line to your Nerf 2, 24-7, so that it always knows exactly how many antioxidants your body needs without taking any harsh drugs or wasting your money on unproven antioxidant supplements that simply don't work. I'm super excited to announce that there is a way to stimulate your Nerf 2 completely naturally so your body can offset the dangerous, damaging free radicals that come in every single day. It's called Protandum Nerf 2 Synergizer. It's the only product in history with seven patents, 24 peer-reviewed studies, you can't fake that stuff, and these studies have proven it actually works and has been featured on ABC Primetime as a miracle breakthrough. In fact, a landmark 10-year federally funded study at the NIA found that Protandum is the only all-natural supplement proven to extend lifespan up to 7%. 7%! Nothing else on Earth comes even close to that. Plus, it has been clinically proven to lower oxidative stress by 40% in 30 days. Are you kidding me? This isn't the fountain of youth, but it's darn close. Within minutes of taking it, your body gets told to start releasing its own antioxidants, destroying those Godzillas, and in turn, reducing pain, improving energy, enhancing your sleep and mood, you can feel younger, live healthier today. Isn't that awesome? But don't just take our word for it. Try your own bottle of Protandum Nerf 2 right now. Best part, it's not even expensive. It's way cheaper and far more effective than a doctor visit, drinking antioxidant drinks, or even eating fruit. It's not another superfood, magical berry, supplement, or harmful drug. It's in a league of its own and has the scientific backing and studies to prove it. You literally can't even shove enough fruits, vegetables, or herbs into your body to come even close to the positive effects that Protandum Nerf 2 will do for you. I can't wait for you to try this for yourself. What would you pay to go back in time, four, five, or even six years ago, to have your youth and vitality back? You can't put a price on that. Do you want to experience what it's like to neutralize the free radicals in your body and live optimally the way we were designed to? Get Protandum Nerf 2 Synergizer today to find out what it feels like to operate your body the way it was originally intended. This is the answer you've been waiting for. It's time to call up those superheroes to take care of those Godzillas inside you once and for all. Grab your Protandum Nerf 2 now and share this video with someone you care about. Awesome. Okay. That was a wealth of information. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is like, seven out of 10 doctors don't even know this exists. And, and my husband always says to me, he said, Monique, you got to able to share it like it's a five-year-old so they can understand it. So I'm so excited. We finally got this video, even though the video is it's a couple of years old, because now there are 30 uh, patents, uh, 30, uh, 12 patents, and there are 30 published studies on PubMed.gov on the product. And uh, um, I like the simplicity of that so people can really see what that means, because the root cause of all disease including PTSD is oxidative stress. Oxidative stress equals inflammation and it causes a whole lot of havoc inside of a body. 
Um, just so like you're, a um, you're a distributor for the product. Yes, I'm a I'm a I'm a, uh, I'm a consultant for the product, and um, it took me. I've been taking it for for ten years, and it took me a minute to really because I was half. Uh, as, as Tuesday with science at my house with Dr. Jumper and they kept telling me, Monique, you should do the business. I said, nope, nope. I just want to share it with people. I just want to help people want to have, have them experience what happened with me that they don't have to waste three years trying to find a solution. And so finally I decided to do it. And, and it's, and it has brought so much passion and joy when I get a message from someone, this is what it did for my mom. This is what I did for this. This is what it is for that. And it just goosebumps all the freaking time goosebumps so, cool. so how would one get in touch with you how do they get go about getting the prop getting the, the uh, okay uh, they can they can they can email me at monique at monique manon.com it's m-o-n-i-q-u-e at m-o-n-i-q-u-e-m-a-n-n-e-n.com email me there i'm also on facebook i'm on instagram so you you can find me on all social media as well Monique. Give that email out again because it's okay, a little confusing. <laughs> it's Mo my name, Lucy, my name, Monique at yeah. moniquemanon.com. Oh, okay, cool. All right, you have yeah. used it a couple of times. Okay, great. Let's oh, yeah. some good information. Uh, I'm sorry. Do you guys you have questions? You want, you want to share these pictures that you have or no? Well, because we, we, we're running a little out of time, aren't we, Consuelo? Yeah, we're so, running a little bit out of okay, time. But so I can do it next that. time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. And uh, Ellie, I think you had, am I pronouncing your name right? Okay, you had, uh, you want to share your book, Why You Matter? You're muted. No, I think that was Anne. She wanted it shared. Somebody asked for something like that. So I just put it up there. And earlier, uh, Matt had asked for pictures and email and all that to post mm -hmm. on a website. So I just can you post, can you share that? Uh, I just did it on the um, chat. I just posted all that information for can anybody. Can you get that, uh, Charles? Post it, let everyone see it. Uh huh. Let's and then it can go up to the resource page. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. And I could put it on the resource page. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to put it on the screen so everybody can see it. I got it right here. And, uh, what is Ellie's last name? Painted Crow. My last name is Painted Crow. So can you spell it? Uh, P it's like in Paul, A I N T E D C R O W. Okay. There's you go. Painted Crow. Ellie Painted Crow. Okay. Okay. Why That's you great. matter? A simple path towards healing, balance, and wholeness through indigenous and Western healing practices. Very good. And how you get in touch with you, Ellie? Um, I put my email uh, turtlewomenrising at live dot com. Can you repeat that again? Turtlewomenrising at live dot com. You can email me there. And um, I think I posted where you could purchase the book. It's not on Amazon or anything. Um, it's mm. on blurb, blurb.com, I believe. And I added the link there on one of the, one of those messaging chats. So um, just want to okay, put it up. It. Okay, well, Anne would like to have your information. And I'll, uh, it's on the chat. Do you see it? I don't. And yes, I'm sorry. Did you hear me? No, I couldn't hear you. Is, oh, do you sorry, see what, it? Did you, what did you ask? You wanted her contact information. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm on a chat and I don't see her email. And I uh, it says that it's sent to everyone, so I don't really know how to make that. Yeah, I'll share it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see. I don't know if I can share the chat. That's a whole different. So it's deal. turtle, T U R T L E, women, yes, M E N. Yes, yeah, you, you got, got it. it. Okay. You got it. Okay, we are going to be closing the show. Yeah. Uh, so, Charles, did you have anything to close with? 
Um, no, not today. He was today. supposed to be gone. <laughs> yeah, you supposed to go to the Super Bowl party. <laughs> yeah, I know the game is already going. It's already. Uh, I won't do it. Yes. I won't tell the score. So don't okay. do it. I'm, I'm waiting for Rihanna. So before all right, Friday so the show, to close us down. We would like to encourage our viewers and listeners to visit Operation Confidence resource page for some amazing resources. Also, we would like to inform everyone about Operation Confidence Positive Redirection Team, a group of male and female veterans who are mentors having overcome similar challenges and situations transitioning back into mainstream society. To be connected or become a team member, email us at info at operationconfidence.org. We are so excited about Operation Confidence Combat Boots and Lace Women Veterans Mentoring and Creative Arts Group and Operation Confidence Distinguished Male Veterans Mentors and Dress for Success Modeling Group. To get involved, email info at operationconfidence.org. Zoom meetings will take place the first Saturday of each month. Okay, thank you. And as always, we want to remind our viewers that the goal for the show is to raise awareness about Operation Confidence's mission, which is to provide stable housing with a wide range of supportive services for our veterans, especially those who have experienced homelessness. So to get involved with our grassroots efforts, we want you to please send us an email at info at operationconference.org or visit our website at www.operationconference.org. And we want you to not to forget to please subscribe to American Invisible Heroes uh, talk uh, and YouTube channel. Blah, 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 I'm getting tongue tied. Let me say that again. Please subscribe to our American Invisible Heroes on YouTube. We have our own channel. And as of June 4th, 2001, do you know we have now over 114,000 views? We are so excited. Who knew? <laughs> so Honey, we're really excited about it. Yes, yes, sir. You said June 4th, 2001. Now you have to come with a better date than that now. Well, we started then. Oh, so you said as of June 4th. Okay, when we started. Yeah, we started then. And okay. so as of that time, we have now 14,000 views. Duh. Yeah, but if we started then, we couldn't have had that many views. Yeah, so it's got to be as of January, maybe, or February. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> Charles. No, we joined in 2004. I know. I know. You I'm tell me we ahead. joined June 4th, 2021. Would you shut up? I don't need to do <laughs> hey, I gotta get my humor in there. Okay, good. Oh, is that what you're doing? Well, I don't need it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. So anyway, we want to encourage our viewers. Please don't forget about us because we need mm -hmm. your support. We're asking everybody to donate even one dollar to our Operation Confidence Teeny Housing Building Fund. So uh to get involved, as I said, please email us at operationconfidence.org. And we want all of our people to know that American Invisible Heroes is also streaming on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts, as well as Amazon, iHeart, Stitcher, and Twitch Podcasts. So we're excited. We're getting the word out. We want to thank our amazing guests coming on today. We had some informative, wonderful information. And we want you all to know we'll be back next Sunday. I think my baby girl, she has attend her i call her my baby girl taylor she has to attend a function at her church next week but we'll be back here again and dr children you'll be back with your video and in a quiet <laughs> environment we want to thank elaine elaine thank you so much for blankets of love that's so precious and of course i don't want to mess up your name <laughs> elaine uh, we want to thank you for sharing about our wonderful uh, Indian background, you guys. And plus, we I'm happy to say that I'm a descendant as well. And thank you, Anne Montague, girlfriend. You know you're one of our favorites, so we want to thank you. And then Monique, I hope you enjoyed the show. We want to thank you as well. And I'm, and I'm kind of interested in that product, too, so make sure you let me know how I can get some. And then, as always, we got our Charles. <laughs> I'm the one that 
that's got to bring a little controversy, you know, to the team to, to, to keep. Uh, yeah, he's our funny part, guy. You know, so. So, okay, we'll sign us out, Charles. Give us our ending. Okay, video. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to show you the the two videos and then I'm going to come back and do the ending video because for whatever reason, um, I'm having issues over here, but I'm going to do it right now. And then uh, we will sign out. So don't don't stop till I put the other one on if you don't mind here. Okay. That's which one are you showing? show the the end and we're gonna sign out at that time yes all i see is you what we don't see the screen oh, wow. I don't know what to tell you, man. why don't we just end it we'll show it next week uh, there you go Okay, well, we thank you so much, everyone, and we'll be back next week. Thank you. Bye. All right, y'all. Take care.